Good afternoon and welcome to day three of CHCI's 2020 Leadership Conference. I would like to welcome you to the session titled The Future of Retail. My name is Stefania Yanochkov and I'm the Vice President of External Affairs at CHCI. I've been with CHCI four and a half years. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Facebook, Walmart, Brookfield, and Westfield for their generous support of this session. Before we begin our panel, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our panel host, Congressman Juan Vargas, and our moderator, Christina Antello. Congressman Vargas represents California's 51st Congressional District, which includes all of Imperial County, as well as the southernmost portions of San Diego County. Representative Vargas sits on the House Financial Services Committee, as well as the Committee on Foreign Affairs. This session will explore new consumer habits and industry trends resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, which has forever changed how we shop. To help us moderate this important and timely discussion, we're delighted to have a trusted advisor, skilled advocate, and effective negotiator as our moderator. Christina Antello is a senior strategist and CEO of Ferox Strategies. She's been featured in Washingtonian Magazine in success stories of Washingtonians of Latino and Hispanic descent and identified as a power player and most influential 40 and under leader in other regional publications. Christina provides insider advice on how public policy is created and communicated. I hope you enjoy this session and don't forget to continue the conversation on social media with the hashtag, hashtag CHCI HHM20. Hi, this is Congressman Juan Vargas. I proudly represent California's 51st district, which includes Southern San Diego County, all of Imperial County, and California's entire US-Mexico border. I'm honored to be joining you at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus's Institute's 43rd Annual Awards Gala. We are gathering today to celebrate and uplift the heroes of our communities. We are also here to have meaningful discussions on how the pandemic is impacting our today-to-day -to -day lives and how we are preparing for years to come. At this time, I'm very concerned with the health and financial impacts people are facing as a result of this pandemic. We are diligently working in Congress to ensure that every possible resource is dedicated to combating the public health and economic impact of COVID-19. Small businesses in my district have also been heavily impacted let me assure you, my colleagues in the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and I are doing everything in our power to help small businesses, families, and workers get back on their feet. This is a fact. COVID-19 has disproportionately affected Latino, Black, and underserved communities. These trends are real in my district and around the nation. This global crisis has also shown us what we already knew. Our nation relies on our immigrant and essential workers, even more so during this crisis. Many residents in my district are essential workers who do not have the privilege to work from home during the pandemic. A lot of them are working as healthcare workers, as farm workers, at our local grocery stores or in the hospitality industry. Our Latino community is growing at a rapid rate and is a key contributor to the economy, labor force, and the electorate. In fact, Latinos will contribute more than any other population segment. Our community matters now more than ever. Our voice is our power. On behalf of California's 51st District, thank you to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for all of the work that you do for our communities. Your work today will benefit the generations to come. Hi, my name is Christina Antello and I am a board member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute and I want to welcome you all to our panel today, The Future of Retail. First, the focus of our panel. Obviously, with one in four jobs in the United States, this is in a tremendous sector for, for us in this country. And now, in terms of the pandemic, we're facing new challenges. And in this panel today, we want to talk about what the future of retail might look like now during COVID and soon thereafter. I want to remind everyone, all of our guests, to please use the hashtag CHCIHHM20. 
and be sure to submit your questions in the platform as we would love to get to those later on in our conversation. I wanna welcome our guest today. First, Nadia Martinez, who is the founder of Cali & Co on behalf of Facebook. Also, Anna Arguello, the Vice President of Merchandising for Do It Yourself at Walmart. Meredith Darnell, the Senior Vice President for Business Intelligence and Strategy at Brookfield. And Nino Rodriguez, our Vice President of Shopping Center Management at URW, Westfield. I wanna take a second for each one of these panelists to be able to introduce themselves a bit and tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. Nadia? Hello everyone, it's very nice to be here. My name is Nadia Martinez and I am the founder and owner of Cali & Co. We are a small business based out of um, Orange County, California. We're dedicated to the manufacturing of women's shoes that focus on fair trade and slow fashion. Anna. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. My name is Anna Arguello. Um, I'm a proud Mexican, super excited to be here with you today. I'm a vice president for Department 12, which is called Do It Yourself, paint, accessories, and all the fun industries. Um, uh, Walmart, largest employer in the country and, uh, and a largest retailer in the world. Super happy to be here again. Meredith. Nino, are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi, Christina. I'm Nino Rodriguez. I'm uh, Vice President of Shopping Center Management for URW, um, known as Westfield. Uh, we're headquartered in Paris, and we operate um, and develop um, premier flagship retail throughout the continental Europe and the United States. Great. Meredith, can you hear me now? Let's go to our first question. Um, first, we wanted to think about our, our in terms of our questioning um, in two broad themes. First, the future of retail um, now in response to COVID and Corona. Uh, Anna, I want to start with you with Walmart. Walmart was quickly deemed essential retail and you were able to remain open throughout the pandemic, even during various lockdowns in other in, in various states. And I'm sure through that process, you all were able to learn several lessons that you were able to impart uh, to other retailers as they were able to open generally and, and, and to other sectors of the economy. I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what you were able to learn dur during Corona that now you're able to kind of, again, impart to others and, and use as lessons learned. Thank you, Christina. You're touching such an important word, learning, right? A common theme in Walmart these days is absolutely learning, and we see learning as a corner store of change. Uh, there has been lots of learnings this year. We have been pushing our limits. We've been refining and reiterating faster than ever, supporting each other faster than ever and like never before. And, uh, and more importantly, I think we have learned to listen and to lead not only relying in our heads, but relying in our hearts, uh, because we truly believe that that's where change needs to start. Uh, you probably saw an amazing uh, uh, result uh, from our earnings release. Uh, you saw that our U.S. operation had a 9.7 um, increase and e-commerce a 97% increase. So that's a substantial number of growth. And that already tells you some of the learnings in terms of channel mix, right? So very interesting. So what are, what are the things that we have done? We have uh, quickly adapted uh, to different customer needs. We have been able to leverage our global supply chain uh, to meet the consumer demand. With the spike has been tremendous and absolutely exponential. We've been putting for sure safety protocols and procedures in place and implementing uh, you know, leave policies for all our associates. Uh, we've taken the necessary measures uh, to ensure the well-being of our stores, our fulfillment centers, our distribution centers. We're such a large company and uh, and we're making sure that everyone's safe as the top priority. So just giving you uh, an, an idea of all these measures and moving into a more tactical level, uh, we've been uh, doing deep cleaning and sanitizing. We've been doing the health screenings and you know, the temperature checks that you see everywhere, requiring associates and customers that you need to wear masks. We have 
We call them health ambassadors in stores. We have people and associates recommending and explaining the relevance and the importance of wearing masks. Um, we have been posting signs at the stores. We have those plexiglass barriers, which people call them the sneeze guards, the plastic sneeze guards. Uh, we've been limiting the number of customers to make sure that we can social distance. Uh, we've been adjusting the operating hours in stores, offering a lot of contactless uh, payment services, more and more and more, and we keep learning as we go. So this has been an amazing opportunity for us uh, to have high expectations and be able to, to, to serve our customer and to protect our associates as well. Thank you, Anna. I think from there, I want to go over to, to when some lockdowns were starting to ease and non-essential retail was able to open up as well. Meredith, just to check in with you, or can you hear me now? I can, thank you. Perfect. Why don't you introduce yourself first and then I'll ask you my next question kind of to, to feed off of what Anna was talking about. Great. My name is Meredith Darnell, and I lead the business intelligence and strategy team for the retail portfolio at Brookville Properties. So simply, we spend our time really thinking about how do consumers spend their time and money, and how does this impact our retailer strategies, and contextualizing that for Brookfield so that we're really able to curate and manage our centers to best serve their local communities. Well, then perfect. What you can add on to Anna, Anna was talking to us about how essential retail was allowed to stay open even through various lockdowns. But I wanted to know through through your perspective, you know, what are the creative ways that um, Brookfield and, and URW, um, which I'll, I'll turn to Nino in a moment, but you were able to, to be able to to offer your, your customers ways to continue shopping or as soon as opening was, was, was possible, how you were able to, to help manage that. Of course. I, I was listening to what Anna was saying and I was loving so much of what she was speaking about because this is also the strategies that we are considering as well. So as you mentioned in April, many of our locations had to close due to the pandemic and yet our retailers still had inventory in their stores and there's still consumer demand. It's, it's interesting. Consumers did not stop shopping during this period. So we wanted to do our best to partner with our retailers and allow them to service those consumer needs. So many of our retailers were using their stores as dark stores or really like micro fulfillment centers. So they were still able to take orders, almost like a buy, you know, buy online. And then how we were able to quickly stand up a curbside pickup service across many of our properties. And this gave a centralized location that our consumers knew they could drive up and pick up that transaction. Our retailers knew exactly where to go. And we were able to offer a very efficient kind of cost effective a solution for many of our retailers who just couldn't open their stores to the public. So this has been very well received and something that we will see continue uh, continuing to do as we move forward through the holiday season. Nino, I, I want to turn over to you. The CDC has released some guidelines around shopping and, and kind of classifies it as one of the activities that is least risky, right? So they, they, not that they've ranked them completely, but to say that there are some activities that are more risky than others and shopping seems to fall pretty far down on that list. Can you tell us more about what you're doing, URW Westfield Malls are doing to, to help uh, ensure that the shopping experience remains safe? Absolutely. Um, we looked at this um, because we have centers in Los Angeles with high Asian populations. We started looking at this really back in January and February as the pandemic was um, developing in China and we, we, when we still had not seen cases in the U.S. because we saw that it was affecting customer behavior. When um, we had to shut down middle, starting middle of March, um, we had a period of about two months where we really got to understand our processes as um, center management teams. And we put together 10 10 focus groups based on different lines of business. And it, it was everything from signage to emphasize social distancing, um, a massive procurement of hand sanitizer to make sure that we had those within center uh, for our customers to pick up like everybody else on the call, I'm sure. Um, we can all swap stories about sourcing hand sanitizer. Um, but we um, certainly went through each discipline in our business and it was it encompassed everything from not only keeping our customers safe, but how do we keep our retailers safe? And when we do our curbside service, which entrances and exits um, uh, were uh, affected a flow of traffic so that people weren't running into one another, um, putting decals on the floors to remind people of those paths of travel to make sure that there were the least amount of interaction as possible, uh, but also going through our management offices and, you know, uh, keeping our, our own employees 
um, socially distance, make sure they're cleaning up after themselves, um, really influencing every level of, uh, level of behavior from washing your hands to staying six feet apart to putting barriers in our kitchens um, and looking at every single piece of that retailer journey, customer journey, um, and employee protocol that need to be put in place. Um, it was a really exciting time for me to be uh, a part of this industry because like our retailers, uh, we were constantly pivoting um, refining, uh, double checking, uh, checking in with each other to make sure that everything that we were doing was really thought through. And then not only did we do that um, uh, in, in developing all these procedures, uh, we worked really closely with Bureau Veritas um, to, um, to certify those standards and, and against an industry and our own, which we consider to be a best in class standard, um, and test that and audit that and make sure that we were doing what we're saying we're gonna do. So just don't take our word for it, but here's some outside verification that does that. And actually just yesterday they announced that um, they were giving us their um, safeguard label um, certifying our, our procedures against um, against a, an international standard. So we're really proud to have that in 28 of our US shopping centers um, just announced yesterday. Fantastic. You know, one of the things I love about this panel, turning to, to Nadia, is we, we started with Walmart, literally the largest employer in the United States. And I and Nadia, you're here to represent the small business. Can you tell us about how your small business, Ali & Co., has not only survived COVID, but has actually found a way to thrive? Absolutely. In my perspective, perspective i'm sorry i think it will be a little bit different but i think it offers such a different variety into what's going on into retail for example um i've created this business uh, six years ago and we built 100 percent online however um through facebook instagram and you know social media even newsletters we've been able to remain connected to our customers the primary thing that happened here was that when everything happened right everything was going down my first thought was what am i supposed to do people are going nowhere and i sell shoes you know, do you see that? It's like, who's going to need shoes at the moment, right? And then I turned to the same community that we've been building for the past six years, and they came to the rescue. We had our biggest month in sales um, back in May, and that was such a big difference because it set the tone for what we were going to do moving forward. So we had an office where we were doing everything in-house for fulfillment, you know, um, operations, as we can say, we're a small business, so it was quite limited. So we decided to move 100% online. And this was in an effort to, to be able to um, fulfill the orders uh, just in time, but at the same time to tell our customers, hey, we're still here, we still need your support. But something beautiful that I personally saw happening was that uh, people wanted to support small businesses. They knew that without them, we were just not going to make it. So I turned to Facebook, you know, between boosting or posting on Instagram or connecting with uh, um, our audience. We decided to expand our reach through Facebook ads. And then one of the best things that can happen here is that you can connect with anywhere, anyone, anywhere. You can set the country, you can set whatever interest you're interested in or you want to target. And they came to the rescue. People really, really showed up for us. And I think one of the, another lesson that, that, that we learned through all of this is that you have to remain um, in touch with your community. You have to let them know, hey, I understand you have the option to go to all these places, right? Like there's Walmart, you know, I'm a Walmart shopper, so I'm there. I love going to the mall with my girls. However, um, there were people that said, hey, I understand they're adjusting to what we need, um, depending, you know, based on the circumstances, but we still want to shop for small businesses. And we're so many of them. We're mm -hmm. so many of them. And at the personal level, um, through social media, I don't know if this, if this has happened to you guys where you're here of someone selling a lotus, right? Like street corn. That's yeah. my thing. I crossed the border at some point just to go chase this guy who was selling corn because I found out about him through Facebook and then Instagram. He was getting <laughs> tagged everywhere. And then I figure, hey, people can do that for us too. So they were sharing photos of um, them wearing their shoes and tagging us. So I just took the same uh, same strategy that loyal customers in Tijuana had for this guy selling corn. I said, well, then I'm going to use it as well. And it worked. It worked. We've been able to get more followers, more sales. But at the same time, you're able to relate to them like, hey, um, I know I'm not selling corn, right? I'm not selling corn on the street, but I'm selling shoes that are fair trade. They're cruelty free. We make a difference. How about you support us too? And they really show up so nicely. And we continue to grow uh, thanks to them. But we had to adjust from what am I supposed to do? I'm selling an item that is not going to be useful at all to 
I'm taking the same strategy from Facebook that the guy who sells corn in Mexico uses, and I actually followed him too at some point. So it was, it's been quite an adventure. I know, like I said, it's a different perspective from what you guys were talking about, but this is basically what's happening to small businesses in America at the moment. Fantastic. No, I, I love that story. That's amazing. And, and I want to come back to, to you as we now think about, you know, um, the, the, the prospects of life after, after the pandemic and, you know, what's that going to look like? And certainly, again, shopping and is, is such a big deal. Um, you know, even Baron had mentioned that, you know, nobody stops shopping. We just found different ways to shop and, and shoppers want to continue to have every different available avenue open to them to continue shopping. You know, there are sometimes you want to try something on, uh, like shoes sometimes or that dress you're going to go to the gala in or whatever it might be, or you want to thump that melon. Uh, or, you know, there's other times you're perfectly happy to, to buy something online and it's the best, fastest way to get whatever it is you need right away. Um, can you tell us about kind of what you're seeing in terms of Walmart's, you know, trends going forward and, and what you think the future of shopping will look like after the pandemic? Absolutely. So we've seen uh, an amazing, you know, uh, change in terms of customer habits and, and purchasing behaviors. Uh, we know as well that if we have it in the shelf, we will sell it. The issue is finding the amount of inventory that we need in order to satisfy that exponential amount of, of demand. So just to give you some perspective, of course, our customers have shifted uh, purchasing to online. They're using our pickup and our delivery services. Uh, we've seen a lot of like a lot of spike in items and that we didn't see that spikes in, 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 the, in, in other seasons, in other years, just to give you an example. So we saw a lot of bike purchases in spring. And uh, but when I tell you a lot of bikes, trust me, it's a lot of bikes. And uh, and of course, this was more, I mean, about uh, responding about customers trying to be outdoors. Uh, well, at the same time, you know, filling those voids for the, for the social distancing measures. Uh, at the same uh, uh, level of demand, I, I mentioned to you all that I, that I leave the do-it-yourself do uh, categories. And, uh, and the spike here is it's pretty crazy. And, and this is because, one, it's responding to something that the experts called urban exodus. So all these young customers moving away from the cities and moving to older homes so that it's opening a lot of opportunities for renovation, which is cheaper than, you know, going to, to, other, to other locations. Uh, the other one is, you know, a lot of people are using this to, to cope emotionally with, with the fact that they don't have a lot of activities while, they're, while they have been at home. So it's definitely open different, you know, opportunities. And I'm sure that I can, that if I was in person, I could ask, raise your hand if you have done a DIY, a project at your home, and I'm pretty sure that 80% of, of the people in the audience would say yes. Uh, you know, other things happening, uh, you know, college students renovating their parents, you know, room uh, because they're not going back to college. Uh, so a lot of different things happening in terms of different trends. You have people homeschooling, so you need to create the environment to have the kids. You have to create a, a, a gym in your house. You need to create, you know, two different offices as you're working there. So all of these requires paint and ladders and drills and a lot of the stuff that we sell at Walmart. So we really feel that this will become a, a multi-year uh, tailwind for, for Walmart and other retailers. And it will be a, a, an amazing uh, a consumer spend uh, that will benefit the rest of America. So the, the show must go on. Uh, we know that, you know, even though these are very turbulent times, uh, we need to keep innovating. We need to keep offering digital products to our customers. So we're launching Walmart Plus. I'm sure that you have heard about it. We just launched it. It's just out of the oven. So this is a membership program that, uh, that brings together in store and online. We actually call it Omni Channel. And of course, the idea is to save uh, customers money and time like no other retailer. So you need to go and check it out because it has an amazing and very strong value proposition. And just that the other two big things where we're really focused as an organization, not only on the procurement side, but we, con we want to continue to be leaders in sustainability. So we have big ambitions to make sure that we're doing what is right and that we're leading in this space. And the last one, because we've seen this uh, as, a, of course, as, as something that is impacting America, diversity and inclusion. Uh, so we also want to make sure that we're leading in the space 
Uh, we opened the Center of Racial Equality, and Doug McMillan, our CEO, it's 100% committed uh, to make sure that we show up as as great leaders and 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 be able to to take you know this 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 sensitive subject of the agenda to the next level. So super excited to see what it's ahead of us, and super excited to be able to put all these solutions uh, at reach of our customers. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Nino, I, I want to turn to to you next because I, I think there were some aspects there of what Anna was talking about that I think Westfield is also focused on. And so I'm wondering if you can tell me kind of where you see the future of, of physical retail, specifically your shopping centers going, and how you think Westfield will head off some of the competitive pressures. Certainly. Um, you know, Anna mentioned omni-channel shopping, and certainly the digital components are, are a big uh, play for us in terms of how the customer um, shops. Um, a lot of times customers are um, they're using our centers as um, places to gather and obviously in 2019 uh, Westfield put together our reinvent being together program pre-pandemic um, and now that that hashtag uh, and that program uh, takes a whole new meaning in the age of COVID right um, but we we certainly know that the customer spends time researching products before they leave their house they come into a lot of our retail centers uh, with a mission, they know what they what they're going to use the center for. Whether it's for uh, you know a night out with their with their uh, special someone, or a movie night out with the kids, or um, you know finding the perfect pair of black pants for 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 the office. Hopefully, when we when we go back to the office, um, but there we need to integrate those channels um, in, in a really refined way. We've had the Westfield app for a long time, which gives you information on what stores are open. Um, certainly, there are QR codes now that you can um, you can uh, snap within the center to get you information on um, currently stores that are open. Look at directories um, to t show you how to get from one location to another. Um, we're looking at integrating um, inventory with our retailers so that we can look at that more closely. But also, um, we just rolled out um, in the age of COVID um, a new feature to our Westfield app called um, Line Pass. So you can actually, uh, before you even get to the center, look up a store where you want to um, that you want to visit. Take a look at the line, like. You can take a look at, for instance, like Lululemon or you know Old Navy, some of the um, retailers that are, that are participating in that uh, program, and you can see what the line is like. You can sign up for an appointment just like you can at the Genius Bar at the Apple Store, and virtually queue in line. You get uh, the retailers can manage that line uh, within the app, and then you can go in and go. Um, uh, you can get a notification when you're ready to enter the store. Um, there are, you know, kind of merging that digital and physical experience is really important to us, but we certainly still believe in the future of the physical retail um, part being that um, most of our transactions in retail are still online. It's, it's you know, 20, $27 trillion industry and $3 trillion of those dollars are, are spent online. So we're still a huge component of that. And you just can't duplicate a night out on, on a Zoom call. I I've tried it. <laughs> it's not. It's not fun. <laughs> not as fun as being able to, you know, give your give your loved ones a hug or a, a or a, um, a you know a punch on the on the shoulder uh, every once in a while, and then enjoy the same cocktail or the same meal with them. Um, so we certainly still believe in that in that reinventing being together and how we uh, how our families, how our friends um, really use our. Um, our centers as as town centers. We're going back to our roots, and you know, from the 1950s and 1960s, on being a gather a community gathering place. And that community gathering place doesn't stop with just physically being at the center. It's how our centers integrate into the total communities. And so, I think kind of what Anna touched on is um, looking at um, you know everything from being a, a member of your community, and um, not it's not only the safety aspect of it. Um, it's not only the bringing people together in one place, but how how do our centers that are all hyper local? You know, they're all in your local neighborhoods, from from DC to New York to LA and, and my hometown of San Diego. Um, but how do we play within within our communities? So um, we we during Age of COVID, we also launched Westfield Cares as a as a hashtag to highlight some of the efforts that we're doing in our communities. Um, one of the ones that I'm proud of um, being from San Diego is we worked with. Um, Mana de San Diego, which helps our hermanitas and um, in their leadership program, and we gave away laptops um, to our hermanitas that didn't have um, a, a dedicated computer to be able to do their schoolwork. Right, a lot of us um, 
uh, Latinx families have maybe one computer that's shared out through the entire family. And we um, donated laptops so that people could uh, focus on um, for furthering their education, partnered with Cox Communications there as well to provide the internet connections that are needed with that computer. So we're looking at how we integrate uh, within our communities, not just by writing checks, but how do we partner with community stakeholders and help solve issues that are actually facing the community versus, you know, joining a chamber of commerce. Not that I have anything, I, I love our, cha our local chambers, but how do we go that step further and actually solve community problems with our, um, with our communities? I, I love that program with Hermanitas, and uh, that line pass sounds a lot like uh, how Disney kept me from waiting in two-hour lines and made sure I kept getting on a lot of rides. So I, I feel like that's that, that's a really good model to keep keep shoppers as as engaged shopping as possible. Uh, Meredith, I also There's I want to no go, go to you there. next, and <laughs> I want to go to you next, Meredith. Um, I you know I if you can kind of tell us more about the future of Brookfield and. You know, if you can talk to me a little bit about kind of the, the concept I keep hearing is malls are dying. And, and, and I think that that is vastly premature. And, and I'm wondering if you can help talk about that as well. Absolutely. We've been hearing that conversation for several years, even prior to COVID. There are a lot of questioning about the relevance of brick and mortar stores in today's retail landscape. And so during the pandemic, that was kind of the moment that people thought, well, this is going to be it. We'll stop popping in stores altogether and we'll transition shopping online. And what's been interesting to see is that is not the case at all. And what we have seen during the pandemic is the importance of stores has really been magnified uh, across the brick and mortar landscape. So in fact, in looking at the census data for retail sales across April and May, it was very interesting to us that digital commerce kind of peaked at 27%. So even though our options were really all shopping online and websites saw increased traffic, the contribution of that digital channel alone wasn't enough to offset what was happening across brick and mortar. So in May, as stores began to reopen and consumers felt <clears throat> comfortable coming back and shopping, you instantly start to see sales rise again. So the, the, the importance and presence of that brick and mortar store to shoppers is still re very relevant. And so it gives us all the confidence that malls in fact are not dying. And this is our moment that we're gonna start to see just the next change in retail of how we shop and how retailers are using their stores and how we use our mall space to adapt to that and create the type of experience that they really want to see. You know, Nina referred to centers being gathering places, and we feel the same. So we look at our centers as being gathering places, not just for everyday shopping needs, but they're also there to facilitate social time with family and friends and really create an emotional engagement uh, for that consumer and how they feel about the center. And if you look at a lot of our centers, most of them are, you know, really reflections of their community. So we spend a lot of time really understanding and thinking about the culture of the communities that we serve, how we partner best with businesses. And one great example that I love is we actually, in the city of San Antonio, Texas, we have two malls, North Star Mall and the Shops at La Cantera, um, both very different North Star and Enclosed Mall, Shops at La Cantera, Open Air, um, but, but have both been in their community for a long time. And in these communities, we work with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to really understand what's important culturally to our residents. How do we best serve them? So that now we're, we're not bringing in a homogenous retail experience or the same stores, but we're balancing national brands with also local um, businesses that, they're very, that would serve them and that would be very popular there. And recently in the case of the shops at La Cantera, we had a national chain restaurant close. And we could have replaced it with another national chain, but we knew that wasn't the right thing to do. That wasn't how to best serve this community. So we actually discovered a restaurant in Mexico that was owned by a family. They had grown several chains and were expanding into South Texas. And we partnered with them to open their flagship location at the shops of La Cantera. And this has been so successful because it feels very authentic. They bring a sense, not just of great dining, but culture and music along with that experience. And so that's what we really like to see and why we believe malls will thrive because we really truly are members of the community. That's great to hear uh, that there's such that uh, authentic kind of connection to your to, to your communities, Meredith. Glad to, glad to hear that. Uh, I have one more question for Nadia, but before I do, I want to remind our guests that um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, please put them into the platform. Uh, I see that we've already got a couple of them coming in, and uh, I'll be asking those next, but um, by all means, type them into the platform, and, and I'm happy to relay those. 
Uh, Nadia, if you can tell me a little bit about kind of your future after the pandemic. I, I know that you've made a decision to go 100% online, uh, maybe even giving up your office space and starting to use fulfillment centers. Can you talk to us about kind of that transition and what your business model looks like going forward? Absolutely. So something that we learned uh, rather quickly is how people are able to see e-commerce as something so convenient. For example, uh, we're accessible 24-7. Um, in our case, we made it more um, even more accessible by saying, hey, if the shoes don't fit, because this is something that you might want to try, right? Um, we'll do uh, free exchanges, and then uh, you're more than welcome to return them, and then we'll make sure we get it right. Because of the way that you know things have been adjusting through COVID-19 is that some businesses might have to simplify their operations moving forward, you know, because uh, in our case, we were very successful with uh, our sales. Like I said, our community coming to the rescue, creating more uh, brand uh, brand awareness through social media. But not everybody has been able to do that. So as a result of that, one of the, the primary things that we're doing is simplifying the process. Um, in my case, I'm a mother of two. And as a result of you know distance learning, we've had to make even more adjustments to that. So one way to be able to simplify everything was giving up the office space and using the fulfillment center. Why? Because the customers deserve better. Instead of long waits for me, you know, for us to process the orders, this is something that can go out right away. This is something that can be shipped within 24 hours. Um, expenses is something that we might have to minimize too, because in reality, we learn how useless in our case in office space was and how complicated it became to ship all the orders on time. So one thing that I did notice too is that through the different demographics that we serve, there's a resistance um, to shopping online. And that tends to be an older group with the, or even younger group. They still prefer to go to the mall. They still prefer to try the dress on. They still prefer you know, to go to a brick and mortar space <clears throat> and touch it, feel it, however you you know you want to like, connect with the product because our main demographic tends to be ages 22 to 42 and this group is perfectly fine shopping online going ahead and, and, and you know processing the exchanges if they need to but there's a still a specific group that prefers the uh, experience in store and that's not something that we can you know that we can ignore so as a result of that we tend to focus more on that primary group that we know is a hundred percent with what we sell and that's what we you know, advertise the way we do on Facebook and Instagram, we, we target that specific community because we know they're going to respond. Um, I think that it's going to be a really, really good move for us uh, to be online because we're able to scale too. Um, shipping 100 orders in a day or in a week or however it is that we ship in, it can be time consuming. And because our staff is um, military spouses, our husband's job, you know, tend to be the primary source of income in their family. So what we do, what they've done is I'll work when he's not busy, when he's not deployed, when he's not on trainings. So as an employer, I have to adjust to what they can offer, you know, to the company, their time, their their priorities. So it was a no brainer. I say, hey, this is becoming too complicated. Uh, we can minimize the work for us. We can minimize expenses. And we can also simplify the process. And I think that's something that small businesses at this moment are looking for. Like I said, in our, in our primary uh, demographic group, 22 to 42, they're 100% shopping online. They're totally fine with it. But there's that other group, other groups that prefer the, the in-person experience. And that's why I agree, you know, malls are going nowhere. You know, it's a place where I'd love to go, whether by myself or, or um, with my family. So... And the e-commerce side of things, like I said, we remain uh, connected with our community. We did not have to make huge adjustments because we were already online and we've been online for six years. Um, but we do have to adapt to what's happening and simplifying, you know, minimizing expenses and making this process a lot easier for our demographic, our audience and us is a, is a top priority. So it became an easy thing to work around. You know, I've already started to get some questions from the audience. So again, just a reminder, it looks like Nino's trying to cut in. Nino, did, did you wanted to say something yeah, to, to what she was saying there? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on one thing. Yeah, I just want to touch on one thing that both Nadia and Anna um, had, had mentioned as part of the e-commerce integration. And, and we see this really symbiotic relationship between the digital and the physical retail. And they're not, as as, as always reported, like this um, 
they're not always at odds with each other. They're really symbiotic. And I would love to see the growth of Nadia's business um, as she's acquiring more customers and growing that business um, to see her put back physical stores. Because what we, a lot of e-commerce retailers um, like Allbirds that just opened their first um, store at Westfield UTC in San Diego um, within probably the last 30 days um, have noticed this halo effect of um, the physical retail um, and having customers that can come and interact with the brand, um, having a positive effect on their digital sales. So really, those two those two things that we call you know clicks to, clicks to bricks um, really integ- can integrate really well together, and actually it can be really dependent on one another. Absolutely, Nino. You know, I think we see the same thing as many emerging brands start online. It's great; it's great growing brand exposure, and you get sort of this you know instant brand lift, but. All of these retailers, eventually, we love to work with emerging brands because once they start to open stores, their ability to scale quickly really happens. And so we mm-hmm. think about that a lot at Brookfield Properties because 64% of the U.S. population lives within an hour drive of our um, centers across the United States. So it's been really fun to work with some of these young brands and watch how quickly they can scale as they start to get this exposure and people are starting to see that that store is really a billboard. And sometimes it's not even a store. It could be a pop-up. It could be a kiosk in the common area. There's so many ways now that brands can work with physical space to start to grow their business. So I agree with you. I'm super excited, Nadia, to see how your business is going to grow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. No, absolutely. And uh, I, I can testify, um, once you get me in a store, I'm probably going to buy six times as much as I went there to buy. So uh, you never want you never want to kind of cancel that out. Uh, but, I love that. So Anna, I, you I, follow I, all the trends that we're seeing. <laughs> I, absolutely. It's the Walmart effect. You go in to buy some toothpaste and you walk out 200 bucks later. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, I, I do have as a long question as you buy paint, from- I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question here from the audience, and Anna, I'm gonna I'm gonna direct this to you because I do happen to know that Walmart has has made some some moves in this space. But um, Diana is asking, how do you ensure that the retail workforce is prepared for the changing retail landscape? What education and training programs are provided? Yes, that's actually a, a big one, and I actually have some some interesting uh, things to share with you. Uh, I might not have my talking points here, but I can tell you that educating our associates, it's a big, big priority. So in our stores, we created Walmart Academies uh, where we are actively um, educating our associates. We have a Walmart Live Better program, and this is actually giving credits to a lot of the, uh, the, the, the workforce in stores to get them credits for college. So they're actually getting, you know, that, that level of education, not only for their college degrees, but also to be prepared for this major shift. And uh, this is happening at the, at the store level and this is happening at the home office level because the, the change is happening so fast that there's simply not enough training to make sure that everyone can have the right skill set uh, to be able to, to lead, you know, the next generation of retail. Uh, it's been it's been interesting to understand and recognize that there's so many things that we have to learn and at the same time so many things that we have to unlearn which which has been a fascinating journey uh, but again we're investing millions and millions to make sure that 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 is a priority that our that our associates feel you know engaged and and, and motivated and that they have the resources and tools at hand to do that better and to the best and to excel in their job positions. Just just one one more thing, uh, something that I that I keep saying to the uh, to the associates as I walk stores or at the home office, uh, as change you know also can create a lot of anxiety. Um, this is from my CEO Doug McMillan who says um, in the face of change. Uh, don't feel uh, frustration. You have to face it with fascination. So I think that training opportunity will help a lot of people to to cope with change with a lot of fascination in the years to come. I have a, another question here from from the audience, and I, I think maybe I'll turn this over uh, first to Nino and then to, to you, Meredith, to, to to weigh in as well. Um, but I think one generally speaking in, in terms of climate change and kind of packaging has has a big imprint um, and, you know, your your overall footprints um, and, and 
obviously powering all the energy needed for, for one of your shopping centers and things like that, even how you might be located in terms of, you know, closer or far from a city and kind of what that means in terms of traffic patterns and stuff like that. Can you guys give us your interpretations of kind of how you guys are ad addressing sustainability in terms of your, your shopping centers, Nino? Absolutely. <clears throat> it starts a lot with planning on the development phase and where we look at reloc being uh, co-located next to um, public transportation to give us that automatic right of you don't necessarily have to have a car to be here. Um, our corporate social responsibility group works on more than just um, that type of planning. Um, and it's a lot more than just throwing some solar panels on the roof, but we, we do those projects as well, um, especially in, in areas like sunny California where we get a lot of sunlight and utility rates happen to be very expensive those deals pencil very well from a um, from an investment standpoint. Um, so we try to be smart with our dollars and how we invest them, but also looking at um, everything from uh, the physical infrastructure of our facilities, which you know a lot of people don't generally think about. Um, how do we uh, lower our utility cost or our utility footprint? Um, we have an initiative within URW um, to go 50% um, uh, um, carbon neutral by 2030. It's part of our um, Better Places 2030 plan. Um, but that Better Places 2030 plan is not just focused on utility savings or sustainability issues, but how do we integrate that into our everyday business with our retailers? So looking at um, partnering with um, the H&Ms of the world who, who do some more sustainable fashion, um, but also looking at resale. Um, and typically, you know, if you had asked us five years ago if we would entertain doing thrift stores um, in our in our shopping centers, we would say absolutely not. But looking at really good retailers of like Rethread who do um, uh, recycled fashion and looking at that circular economy, um, we certainly um, are committed to that as well. It, and it's not just about recycling programs where we're looking at a number of ways to integrate um, our food courts, which could be huge sources of waste. How do we eliminate um, food waste from from those uh, from our restauranters? Um, how do we do more composting so things aren't going to landfills? Um, how do we um, fulfill our um, all those all those massive amounts of takeout that everyone's doing right now? Um, how do we lower that? Um, how do we lower that footprint? Can we mandate some of it? Can we partner with some of the retailers um, to look at how they're packaging their goods? Um, and um, certainly looking at um, one of the retailers I really love, I think that's doing it right, is Lush. Um, one of my favorite um, Bath & Body retailers, uh, where most of their um, uh, products come with zero packaging. You can go out buy a shampoo bar that doesn't have you know, a 32-ounce bottle um, and get rid of that packaging altogether. And then bags are optional. You can bring your own and toss it right into your uh, Westfield tote bag. Meredith, over to you. Of course. Um, of course, sustainability is a priority for Brookfield as well. And many of the areas that Nino has uh, mentioned that they were looking at and really studying and implementing changes, we are as well. So, you know, we're happy to be a leader in um, solar capacity across the U.S. As Nino said, malls have a lot of flat roofs. So it's kind of a natural place to go. And we really feel as part of our community, the duties to our community, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. So a lot of the priorities we've had beyond solar have gone to not only enabling recycling within our centers, but how do we partner with our retail tenants to allow them to participate as well and really make a difference. And as we talk about the growth of e-commerce and the shipping of packages and think about all the boxes that are now coming to our homes, there's some concern about that sustainability and what that really means. And so again, when we look at the placement of our centers, the fact that 64% of the US population lives with an hour drive, we feel we're really in a great position to start to partner with our, our retailers. How do we help them get inventory close to the consumer? How do we help really be efficient in that shipping capacity moving forward and getting efficient service for the um, consumers, but also cost-effective and sustainably um, correct strategies in order to save on that level of recycling as well? So it's, it's definitely something that we spend a lot of time and have a full team committed to and are investing in every year. And Christina, really and I would love to chime in if I can. I was actually going to come to you for, for one quick minute because I, I do want to get to another question, but I do know that Walmart does a lot with Project Gigaton. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And then we'll ask our, our another yes. question from the audience. Absolutely. As Meredith mentioned, it's a big priority for us, as I mentioned um, uh, before. Uh, so in this Project Gigaton, we have been reducing emissions. We reduced 8% uh, of these emissions in the last three years. 
Uh, we also have an estimated 30% of Walmart's uh, global electricity that are powered by renewable resources, I mean, which is huge. And we are on track to power 35% of our needs uh, by, the, by the end of this year, which is super exciting. Uh, we also diverted 80% of our unsold product packaging and all the operational materials from landfills and incineration last year. And another big number, uh, we recycled more than 300 million pounds of plastic film and rigid plastics globally just last year. So uh, the impact that we can make uh, in this area is huge. And uh, from a meeting that I attended this morning, I know that our ambitions for next year and the next three years will be even higher. So stay tuned. Absolutely. Nadia, do you have something on sustainability? I do, actually, because uh, I founded this company with those core values, you know, with uh, slow fashion, where if we're going to sell wholesale, um, it has to be made to order. We don't hang on to a massive amount of inventory for that particular reason. Uh, we use sustainable materials. We use organic materials. So there's some companies out there, especially small businesses, where we started already with those core, uh, core foundations years ago and we see the improvement that it's been made and i have to say especially as you know big companies like the ones that are here it is necessary it is not something circular circular fashion is something that everybody can make a contribution to and there's so many companies out there in the u.s that are doing this so for us sustainability uh, you know making a difference fair trade fair wages uh slow fashion like i said were made to order it's a priority thing for us like we'll take your order we'll give you a thousand pairs of shoes if you want but you have to give me a certain time because we'll make them we don't hang on to them and we get rid of them so companies are out there you know that we started small but that's the core foundation of what we do and i include myself in those companies so thank you thank you for your efforts that means a lot you know, we have just a few minutes before we need to start wrapping up, but I do want to ask, uh, I think we have time for, for just one more question. Uh, we have one here from Paolo who asks, how do we evolve our malls? Obviously, malls are looking different than they did in the 80s and 90s. So, Nino, can I turn to you first and you tell me a little bit about kind of the process of densification and kind of how you're, you're looking at it as, as people look to live, work and play kind of in the same places? Absolutely. I think we're becoming less focused as a retail company and more focused in creating these mixed use communities and really being true town centers. Um, and like I said, it, it kind of um, evolved from the roots of the, you know, main street shopping that happened in so many of US cities, and they gradually kind of integrated into, into one location. But I think we'll be getting back to those roots and you'll see lots of mixed use and densification projects on our sites. Um, we're um, launching a couple of them um, this year um, on the East Coast and at Westfield uh, Garden State Plaza and at Westfield Montgomery. Um, but certainly um, that's what we're looking at uh, to do for all of our projects. Um, you'll see the being able to live, um, integrate that with, um, you know, starting out your day at a cup of coffee um, at, at your local coffee shop. Um, running into your gym space, which is which are big parts of our um, uh, centers already. Um, we're integrating more and more grocery retail, um, so we're capturing that frequency of visit for that weekly, weekly grocery run, um, and certainly partnering with um, you know big box retailers that have those components um, within them. Within them. Um, 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 and seeing those and integrated seeing more integrated more in our shopping centers, so you're spending you know, your your 24 seven day um, life cycle and really living your life um, without the need to get into a car or get on a train necessarily. Most of the time it's walking or, or even a bike distance away. So certainly um, densifying that into more and more of a town center, uh, which includes medical uses, which are going into, um, we partnered with UCLA to do um, two integrated um, medical centers within our shopping centers here in Los Angeles um, and hoping to expand that partnership. But it's mm -hmm. also your local dentist office, your local, um, uh, you know, any of the services that you would need throughout the day. So you'll be able to really live your 24-hour your lifestyle within walking distance of our centers. If you That's so fantastic. Choose. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I think we might have uh, Meredith coming back to us. Um, I was going to ask her the same question, but maybe we'll go ahead and start uh, a little bit of our wrap ups. Uh, I did want to give all of you the opportunity to be able to close off with with uh, some, some remarks, um, summarizing kind of your view uh, or, or your company's view of, of the future of retail. So Nadia, why don't I start back with you again? Okay, so um, something that I really wanted to uh, tell my fellow small business owners is that do not be afraid to simplify. 
you know, do not be afraid uh, to get in front of new audiences. Social media is great for that. Facebook, Instagram is great for that. Give them a chance. Um, there's so many ways to get in, in front of your, your um, ideal customer. Uh, if you choose to do that, um, you can expand online 100%. And then to other consumers, do not be afraid to try new small businesses like mine. You know, like I said, we have very strong uh, core foundations as far as what we wish to do and what we wish to accomplish. Um, I, what I've seen so far is that uh, e-commerce has become the norm for so many, so many people, a uh, very strong demographic group out there that chooses to go e-commerce. Um, do not be afraid to ask questions. If you can exchange things easily, if you can return things easily, I'm pretty sure businesses will be more than accommodating, especially during this time. And I want to say thank you so much for having me. This has been an absolutely um, honor to be here. Thank you, Nadia. Looks like we might have Meredith back. Meredith, can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Great. I'm going to let you actually go back to that question about the evolution of how we design our malls, especially since that strategy is part of what you do. So if you can tell us just a couple of minutes on that and then give us your closing statement as well, that would be great. Absolutely. So we continually reinvest and redevelop our centers. And as I referred to earlier, we really think about our local communities and try to curate the centers to have exactly what the type of services and uses our communities needs. So a great example of that is a property that we have outside of San Francisco, California called Stonestown. And it had been a pretty traditional mall. And a few years ago, we proactively went and we bought a Macy's box back. And instead of putting in another department store, we really considered the needs of the community. What's really missing in terms of those uses? And we were opening a Whole Foods, a state-of-the-art theater, um, as well as a medical clinic, Carbon Health, which is a new clinic coming out and opening across the United States. And so we were really excited about this opportunity because these are uses that really drive frequency, they're embedded in the community and serve the needs of the customers. So as our, we continue to invest in our properties, I think you will see more everyday uses like grocers, um, being open and added to, to malls where typically you wouldn't have seen that before. And we'll also start to see other commercial real estate uses, in some cases, residential, which is something that we're doing in Alderwood, uh, just north of Seattle. We're adding multifamily housing into that property because there was a need in the community for additional housing. So we're being very uh, careful about how we're analyzing our, our markets, really understanding consumers and the needs and starting to reinvest to continually transform. And I think as we move into my closing statement, I think about that all the time. Retail is such a fun industry to work in because it constantly changes. You know, there's a consumers are emotional. We make decisions not just based on our function, but what we enjoy, how we emotionally engage, how we connect. Mm -hmm. That's how we choose the brands we shop uh, with and the types of centers that we like to visit. So I think this is we're just coming into that next transformation for retail. And I'm super excited and confident about the industry as we move forward. Thank you, Meredith. Anna, your closing start statements. Absolutely. So from our learnings, there is only one customer. We don't have an online customer and a store customer. We have a customer and we have different channels. And as long as we keep that customer centric view, uh, there's going to be space for everyone. And we're going to be able to serve this country as, as they should be, as they should expect. The, the other thing is, yes, there's a lot of change and, and it will, we will continue to see change. And this is only the beginning. But there are things that don't change. Um, I think the foundations of retail will continue to be the same, even though the tactics might change, right? Or quick strategies might change. In our case, there's something that will never change, and that's our values. So we might change what we do in order to win, but how we do it is our secret sauce. And how we win, it's because of our people. We truly believe that our people make the difference, and that's what makes me proud about working in Walmart. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Nina? Thanks, Christina. Um, so Westfield, our centers are really important economic en engines and job creators. Um, and especially now, they're really critical for um, the economic recovery and vitality of our local communities. And not only that, they're really um, important economic drivers for our small businesses. Um, ICSC put out uh, a report recently that says um, 70, almost 70% 70 of, um, of our retailers are small businesses with employees of 10%. 10 10 people or less. So we're, we're really part of that local fabric of community and promoting entrepreneurship and not just the national retailers. But we, you know, in, in our Westfield network, we're 31 centers as, as a network. Um, it's, it includes retail, restaurant operations, and, and you know, as I mentioned before, um, getting into some mixed use developments. And we also, also run um, five leading air, international airports across America. So we're a really huge employer 
Um, we're certainly um, not just a landlord, but the network of centers really provide shops for over 100,000 Americans across the country. So in supporting your, your local retail, um, as well as your local shopping centers, um, you're really providing that opportunity for economic growth for a lot of our families. And I think the count of the uh, uh, congressmen, I still think of them as my uh, Juan Vargas as my local councilman uh, down in San Diego, but a congressman <laughs> Vargas um, uh, mentioned in his opening remarks, like so many of our um, of our brothers and sisters are. Uh, working in essential retail, they don't have the option for working from home. And as a, a, in providing jobs for over 100,000 Americans across the country, that's not just a statistic. It is um, representative of a lot of the constituencies, constituencies that we represent, as well as our families. So, um, you know, I, I really wanted to bring that point home about us being job creators. Thank you, Nino. Uh, thank, again, I'm Christina Antello, um, and on behalf of CHCI, we want to thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to tag us in your photos with CHCI HHM20.